Hello and welcome to Ancient History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today we've got a very special guest. We have the author of Dragonfly Song, Wendy Orr with us today. Wendy, thank you for joining me today. Um, we are going to have a chat about your book, Dragonfly Song, which as you can see, I've got a couple of tabs there as I was, as I was reading it. <laughs> I got very excited. Um, do you want to start off just telling everyone a little bit about what the book is about? Oh, it, it's always funny because um, I, I hadn't sort of, you know, prepared for this and, yeah. and I'm very bad at saying what a book is about, but because it's sort of like, well, it took me 60,000 words to tell you what it is. Yeah. Asa is, um, is an outcast who is actually sort of the high priestess or the, the queen's daughter. So to some extent, it's um, not exactly a retelling, but it jumps off the Theseus legend of Theseus being a, a sort of hidden son of the king and that traditional thing of being the outcast and then mm. coming into her own eventually. Mm. Um, and so this is on a, an Aegean island and this island I actually made up. But what I did was I placed it where Samothrace is. Right. And then occasionally, I, I well, during the writing, occasionally it moved up into the Black Sea, but in the end I... I pinned it down and it was where Samothrace was. And then I actually, for ease and for, um, just because I, I liked it, I then used actually like a scale model of Samothrace. It's about, um, I think from memory, it's, on, it's about a tenth of the size. Right. But that let me have a, a sort of concrete island in my head, but then I didn't have to have its history. Yes, and with this one, um, Swallow's Dance actually probably was more historically accurate, uh, if you can, uh, you know, get anybody to agree on any one thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. But um, uh, this this one, um, Dragonfly Song, I did sort of just use more imagination, but I did a lot of research still. And obviously, you know, she goes to Knossos in the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I tried to have all of that part as accurate as I could. Uh, I mean, given that there's still some historians who don't believe that um, bull leaping took place. To me, that seems strange that there's so many representations of it across Absolutely. the and into Israel and everywhere. But yes, sorry. So I got away from actually what's about. She's a, it's an <laughs> uh, girl. She's mute from trauma. And... Um, she eventually becomes a bull leaper. So again, I use the Theseus um, story of the tribute youths going to Crete. And I pared it down because this is such a tiny island. And I mm. seriously think that if there's some truth in, in tribute, I doubt that it was just Athens who had to pay it. You mm. know, no one probably had a pretty good navy and yeah. if they wanted to keep you safe from other pirates and that sort of thing I'm guessing they took tribute from more than one place mm. so she uh, becomes a, a tribute youth to go to Knossos and uh, learn to do the bull dances and the, the bull leaping or the bull dances whatever they were to me it seems they had to be a combination of religious ritual, also absolutely the excitement of football, sport, whatever. And these kids, if if you survived, and I really have my doubts that that many people would survive too much jumping mm. over the balls. And these were really big balls. They, they stood six foot at the shoulders and wow. the hooves are supposed to be the size of dinner plates i guess it depends on your dinner plate but they were big and apparently they were not particularly well tempered um mm. so i'm guessing that not many people survived it if you did survive you'd be a rock star oh yeah so 
I, I sort of really wanted to, to play with all that. And um, so I guess there's the, the, yes, the sort of mythological feeling of, of fable. Um, mm. But the history part was really important to me too. I definitely found the weaving of mythology and legendary history with the archaeology a lot more prominent in the dragonfly song. Like there was just a, a lot more... Mag this is a bit more magical almost yes. like with um with asa and her ability to draw animals to her what made you want to incorporate like almost like a magical element to the to it um you see again i often don't know why i've done things in a book i mean dragonfly song took a long long time to write because i i kept just feeling that i couldn't do it because it was too big and because it wanted to be sold in verse and mm. so when I started it, it was called The Snake Singer. Actually, I, I'm guessing that it came because of the, uh, the priestess statues with the snakes. I was very, very lucky. This lovely artist, Don yeah. Pepper, did a portrait of me for the Archibald Prize, which obviously didn't, didn't win or you would have heard about it and she told me this is a thank you oh I couldn't believe it I, I've sort of you know thought about this statue well the, you know those those three statues uh, for so long mm. um and so I, you start to wonder about the snakes and so I thought about cobras and how they dance to the um to the flute mm. and I um oh I spent ages and this was before I started writing, when I actually found an email a while ago, I think it was sort of 2008 or something, wow. um, uh, trying to work out how you would sing to snakes to sort of replicate that that flute kind of song. And then I know that snakes are deaf, but then I think, well, they, they respond to the flute, and so obviously they respond to vibration if they don't hear the noise. So I, I <laughs> And then that sort of broadened into her being able to call other animals, but not being able to actually control her gift. Yeah, it, it developed very sort of organically, but yeah, over on and off, probably over about five, six years, um, once I really had this story. I thought it was lovely having these sort of more iconic and um, I know recognizable archeological stories, you know, with the bull, bull leaping and, the, and then the snakes but then bringing in something just a little bit different. That I think that it sounds like the Minoan religion was probably very sort of epiphanistic. That's the right mm, word. And I think so. Um, possibly hallucinogenic, which is mm. for young people. Um, I kind of steer away from. Though I do just mention that they, you know, they collect poppies and they sort of drink the poppy juice, but. Um, and their connection to nature, I suspect, is something that we can't really understand. Like, even if we actually knew exactly what they did, I suspect mm -hmm. that we can't quite understand it. Just as we don't, I don't think that we really understand Indigenous connection to the land. We empathise with it and we think that's great and we understand that we feel connected to our home and that we feel a powerful connection to this sort of I don't know, tree that we love but I think it is a bit different than what you know sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, you know middle class mm. we do we are limited in in that understanding but I just felt we can we can feel that she has a connection to animals mm. One problem when you're writing, even if it was even if it was um, purely for adults, you've got to kind of simplify it down, um, because if you have too much about, you know, the goddess of this tree and the goddess of this, mm. thing, and and so I just try to hint at some of those things, but then kind of simplify it down to okay, mother goddess, mm. and uh, because otherwise your whole book is nothing but an explanation of how you think. Yeah. Or religion might have been, which is actually quite a book. Difficult balance to to manage, especially because I mean, as I was reading it, I found it very similar to 
the Swallows dance when where Yalma was saying that it's got quite a lot of themes that could definitely be brought into a, a high school experience. Like I remember when I was in school and it was all about the themes of identity and belonging and self-acceptance and that all very much comes through in this book. And you don't really want to take away from such important themes that, you know, talking about big questions of, of their their ritual setup, which you just couldn't possibly answer because no one seems to be able to answer it. No. And even <laughs> things that, you know, um, it took me ages to research how she made her, her rope for her sling and mm. things like that. Um, I got onto all sorts of weird mailing lists because I was obviously kind of low-blooded prepper. Um, and... <laughs> But you know, then I, I did this very enthusiastically and my editor very kindly but firmly in the end <laughs> found out that not everybody wanted to read sort of like an instruction <laughs> manual and how exactly to strip the bark to shred it to make the rope to make the skin. <laughs> Maybe you just need to know that she got the bark and she made a rope. And, <laughs> and I did want to ask, because I know you didn't really talk about it, but... Why do you choose to write in both prose and verse? Because I've just, it's so lovely. Like it works really well and sometimes you could come into it thinking that it might be a bit jarring moving from one to another, but I found it very lyrical almost as I was reading it. Why did you choose to do that? Oh, well, thank you. I, I've actually always heard um, my novels in, in like verse before I write them. And then when I go to write, I've always put them into prose. Mm. With this one, uh, and, and this is what I mean about the false starts, about several years of false starts, I kept trying to write it in prose, mm -hmm. and I just, it wasn't true. And, but I felt that it was going to be so complex and long, and, mm. you know, you have to put in a bit of backstory. Absolutely. Um, and I thought that's just going to be really too complex to do in verse. And so I, I, I don't know, possibly a year that I puzzled over this. <laughs> and, um, and finally, you know, I sort of woke up in the middle of the night one night and thought, oh, I'll do it in both. And so I wrote to my editor in the morning and said, well, what do you think? And I actually fully expected her to say no because, you know, nobody's done that before. And something different. My lovely editor, she's, well, why not? Give it a um, go. Yep, yeah, that's right. And so what actually happened is I probably wrote more of it in verse and then put it back into prose. And, and again, that's where it's good having an editor. She said, and my, my present editor, she says, oh, well, this is so beautiful. Now, I hesitate to say it, but I feel like we need to stop and draw a breath. So could you put this back into prose? <laughs> <laughs> I found it like all of the um the verse sections always seemed to be the ones that were riddled with the most emotion like the strongest emotions would always come through and then with the with the prose it was more not the background information but less emotional from Ice's point of view which I just yes. thought it was a great way to split it up and so then you really knew what affected her more than other things which is yeah, that, that was what I planned when I was deciding which which bits um, should stay in verse. And I think, you know, sometimes some, sometimes it didn't go exactly as, as neatly as I planned it in those differentiations. But I, I think that poetry just captures imagination, it captures emotion much mm. better. And so in those deeply emotive times, and because because this is mute for well, most, pretty well, all the book. Mm. Um, and she's also very, very young at, um, at at the start of the book. And so I think trying to present emotion and, and feeling a bit more. So I think, I think that's why I do it. Um, and the one that I'm just finishing now, again, I seem to have written more of it in verse and put back into prose, um, even though, no, oh, it's actually just as deep. I was going to say maybe <laughs> not quite as emotional. <laughs> I, I think with Dragonfly Song, I, I actually realised later I was drawing a lot on, on some of my feelings about um, 
uh, I, I hesitate to call, really call myself disabled now because I'm very, I, I can do most things, mm -hmm. but I had a, a long period where I was, I was quite disabled after breaking my neck and, and wow. a lot of, I broke a lot of stuff. And um, I think that that feeling of being excluded from the world sort of uh, mm -hmm. really probably fed into, into parts of it. Well, and, you can definitely read the raw emotion from it. I really felt very like connected to the character and when you get to book two because it is it's not an even split you know the first what two thirds of the book is part one and then it goes to part two and you can't help but feel just overjoyed that she's finally even though she's still not speaking it doesn't matter because no one else can say anything no one is speaking the same language and you can't help but feel just so happy that she's finally in this area where people are not spitting at her <laughs> yes it was, yeah it's really oh. nice not to be spat at um, yeah <laughs> and yeah, when it when it sort of struck me, oh, of course they're from all these different places. Nobody can really understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, that was really wonderful for me because a lot of these things, as I say, it's not that you plan all these details. You you write it. Yeah, I mean, I have a shape, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but sort of into it before you think, oh no, they she's going to be so much more equal now. I was wondering, um, I know that you went to Crete and you researched, you, you got the chance to research a lot for, for Swallow's Dance. Did you go there before you finished Dragonfly Song or did you was that after you'd finished this one? It was it, it was actually really amazing timing because um, I finished my final corrections on the proofread, which was sort of like, I must have been really close to the 10% you're allowed to change. Um, and I think I finished that on April 30th and then we flew to Crete on May 4th. Wow. And so, <laughs> so it was done and I had, I didn't have an advanced copy even to take with me, but I had a picture of the cover. So I, I laminated this picture and I took pictures around Knossos and said, here's me, <laughs> <laughs> or here's my dragonfly in front of Knossos. <laughs> and, um, and then the, the really, uh kind of hairs on the back of your neck moment for me was I as I said in that other interview I just had this incredible day with with Dr Sabina Beckman and um so of course I told her with with some trepidation about getting a fly song um mm. and I said uh, the, the the dragonflies I was sort of kind of making excuses as to why it's the dragonfly motif and I said it was just that throughout the writing of this book every time I made a decision or saw what was going to happen it, it seemed that I saw a dragonfly wow and, um like within 24 hours and it, which so then that was when I realized that I not only had to weave them into the story but that her name would mean dragonfly which it hadn't when I started. Wow. And so she listened to all this and she said, but but you know, of course, that the um, dragonfly was one of the symbols of the yeah. Minoan goddess. And I said, no. And she said, sort of nonsense, of course you know this, you know, you know this this famous fresco. And it was one I'd never seen. Or if I'd seen it, I hadn't understood what the figures were on the necklace. I think still at the time that I wrote Dragonfly Song, I don't think I'd discovered academia.eu. No, so I really think I had missed the dragonflies. Wow. Or if I hadn't, it was quite subliminal. Perhaps I, you know, had registered. Um, and so that was just such a magical oh. moment for me when yeah. she said that. Um, no, it's all meant and, to be. Yes. And so that was quite a different experience to go to create then and mm. what on Knossos um, and sort of this road, this is actually the road that my girl walked up. There are different places where they might have had the bull, the bull leaping. Mm. But, you know, in the end you, you sort of choose one for your own emotions, you know, and, and standing there thinking, okay, I know that I made Asa up. I know she didn't exist. But I truly, truly believe that there were, teenagers mm. leaping over bulls 
in front of a big audience. Um, so, you know, so I'm going to say on this, you know, on this arena. And, and that was really phenomenal. Well, as I said to Jan, it actually, uh, the being present on the actual side, especially at Akrotiri, really um, kind of floored me and overwhelmed me for writing Swallow. Mm. And, and uh, so in some ways it was kind of fun to to do it to do drag place on completely from research and imagination. And I felt like the only thing I had that I'd really got wrong was not realizing how prickly uh, the wild asparagus is. That's really wonderful. <laughs> and hard to understand the um, the power of that, the scent of thyme or, or, or organo uh, when you're out in the open until you experience it. You know, it's something I've read about a lot, but... Mm. Um, to actually be walking out and realizing that somebody is 200 meters away because you look up because you smell wow. the time and, and look up and see how far away they are. So I thought, well, that's not too bad. But no, Dragonfly Song really was imagination and research. <laughs> and so you're glad that you didn't go to Knossos first before you, you finished the book, before you wrote the book? Are you glad that you went there and felt the, the sense of it rather? Then use it so. for research because and of course with Knossos there's so much research so uh, you know you've got 3D models of it you you know you can trace your way through it um, and so many even the photographs you know uh, you know you can picture where it is and and of course the photographs tend to leave out the sort of staking lines of tourists waiting to get in. Mm. Um, and as I say, I think that can take away from it. So I think going mm -hmm. to other places that aren't quite as well documented, um, it's fantastic to be there. But it can also, it's amazing, isn't it? Just it's phenomenal. And yes, I, I know there's so much criticism of, of the reconstruction, but that's what's captured people's imagination. So otherwise, you know, nobody would go because going to Gornia, which is such an amazingly complete little village, um, but nobody goes there. Do you think because you, because Minoans, like we've got so many images and things left over, but we don't have any text, do you think that's potentially a reason why you were so interested in writing about them? Because there was potentially more chance for imagination and leeway versus writing on a culture that we know a lot about? I'm not sure. That's a, that's a really good question um, because I suspect that if I had started this in an organised way and decided I will write about one period of history and this will be it, I might have felt that that was too loose. I mean, when I was a child, I always thought I was going to write about Roman Britain, mm. um, like Rosemary Sutcliffe, who was my big hero as a, as a child. And, uh, well, still now. I mean, still um, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I realised that sounded like no, not anymore. <laughs> um, and certainly, you know, there's a lot, obviously, Romans, there's a lot more text. Um, mm. But yes, I think maybe, maybe the psychological puzzle or the freedom yeah. to, to interpret it yourself, maybe that has drawn me in. That's interesting because nobody's asked me that before. And I, I hadn't... Um, I hadn't thought about it, but I, I do wonder because I love that feeling of, okay, I'm going to read this theory and this theory and this theory, and I'm very easily swayed. So you know, <laughs> every one I read, I believe. Then I go back and I think, well, no, human beings don't act like that. Mm. That doesn't make sense to me. You know, just like I don't think the Minoans were all sweetness and light, even if they had a high priestess. Mm. Or lack of fortifications. They probably were still and somewhat, that, you know, there's probably war. The fortification thing is starting to yeah. be really endowed, I thought. Um, that, uh, you know, I've read quite a few things of, oh, okay, maybe there was no fortification here, but it was actually a totally defensible natural bit. And actually maybe there are remains of a wall here. Mm. Or um, potentially they were just so confident in their dominance and their strength and their navy that they didn't think they needed them. 
Exactly. Never know. Yes. Yeah. If you have a really powerful navy, you may not need to defend all the parts of your island. Yeah. That's <laughs> so ironic. And and how come there are myths of them getting tribute and everything? They didn't have a powerful navy, and yes. So I mean, I think they probably had a high priestess. I I feel very convinced about that. Whether mm -hmm. she was the only ruler, I also doubt yeah and whether that made everything sweetness and light i really doubt i mean i i was in college in in london um when margaret thatcher uh well actually she was education minister then before uh, before she was prime minister but there's i don't remember anybody saying well that's right you know this is the softest prime minister <laughs> we've ever had um so I, hmm. I I like that thing of being able to wiggle around and think this makes sense to me. But to weighing it up with, if not facts exactly, but knowledge approximating the facts as, as clearly as we can. I mean, the fact that nobody agrees with when the Santorini eruption was. You know, you start going along and you say, oh, so it's, I mean, for years, it was 1450 BC and then... And 1628 no. now. Exactly. And that changes the whole timeline of everything that people, you know, what they thought was happening and why they thought it was happening just completely ruins it. I think it's fantastic. I love that. And, and it certainly also let me say, okay, this is what I've decided. And if, if all the really eminent people can't even decide about this date, then... I can make up my mind about some things. And yes, one of the reasons that I thought I was so lucky to have this friendship and mentoring from, from Sabina was that she was, I think, it's called an ecological archaeologist. So her passion was recreating things. She built her own Minoan house, just loved being outside and, and working at things. And well, and in okay, case, so I'll tell you another creepy story. When I sent my editor the um, the first draft, or the, I don't know, part of the first draft, uh, short enough that she could read it in two hours. And now, when you send stuff to an editor, you know, you never know; they might be really bogged down, and you might not hear for three weeks or six weeks, or you know. And so I got an answer, um, so a couple of hours later. And I just read this and I've just come back from walking in the treasury gardens and um, looked up and just dragonflies everywhere. Oh my God. And, and then the last one is the day that I sent, well, one of my many final drafts, uh, but I really thought this was the final, it was the final draft actually, it was just before all the, changes and it was actually Christmas Eve and I went outside and I lay down on the lawn and I looked up and I have never seen so many dragonflies I didn't know you could have a swarm of dragonflies or wow. but I realized there were just hundreds of dragonflies over my head that is and spooky it was very spooky <laughs> the world was just the, the world was telling you that you're on the right track you know you're doing a good thing Oh, well, that was, I reckon. That was, and, uh, you know, uh, and the book did quite well <laughs> in terms of yeah. prizes and things. And <laughs> right, can I show you one other thing? I don't know if it'll come up. Please. Please do. Because I've. This, this is kind of, so how kind of random my research is. So, you know, it's kind of embarrassing on this platform. I was actually no, I love in it. Denmark mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was at a, we were at a wedding. And basically, everybody was either an author or a scientist. And uh, so we were sitting on this beach where the groom had lost his wedding ring and um, <laughs> diving for it all afternoon. And, <laughs> and I heard one of the scientists say to his children, uh, so, you know, this is a piece of flint and, you know, this is what flint was used for. And I... Um, reached down beside me and I picked up this pretty little rock. It looks sharp, yeah. It's very sharp. 
I picked it up and I thought, oh, so this is flint. And I thought it's it's quite sharp and maybe it's an off cut for something. And because there's no way that I could just sit there and put my hand down and pick up this little cupper. And I thought, I'm not going to ask the scientist because I'm a fiction writer. If I want this to be my little piece of tool, then it is. And as I learned more, mm -hmm. um, this actually is really comfortable to hold. You can see where it's kind of shiny on, on, on the yeah. two sides. And so while I was writing Dragonfly Song, I, I went down and I went outside and I cut a oh, branch about that big around. I didn't, I know this sounds, I didn't want to damage my flint. Um, Fair enough. It, it's a very definite serrated edge. I actually suspect it's not an off cut, but the, the mm. fact that I have really nice thumb holes, I think I've got this little <laughs> flint knife. And I don't want anybody to tell me different. <laughs> it wasn't in any archaeological place. It was just this beach on a, an island in Denmark. And so um, I, I didn't have any responsibility to turn it in as no. an archaeological find, um, especially since I was totally convinced I was wrong. Um, but, yes, as I learned more and actually started looking up sort of, uh, I think, once I called things like this kind of like a scraper or a cutter, and it's yeah so this this became ace's knife amazing that's awesome it, it was sort of and of course the next then but then we walked walked back to where we were staying and saw a dragonfly um of course so, of course okay so that um, that means it's a knife because <laughs> what I, are you I, thinking I, is the right track <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely it was because it, it, it just kept happening um with wow. the uh, with the dragonflies well, do you, do you hope that this book and your Swallows Dance as well will hope will make kids, younger students, be more, I don't know, familiar with these different types of history earlier on? Because, I mean, as an Australian, I did not learn anything about any of these cultures until I chose to in university. Like, I didn't even know that they existed until my first year of university. Do you hope that that will open up more of history for kids? Oh, I hope so. And... <laughs> I feel like I don't really care if they're interested in Minoan history or ancient history. I just like kids to be aware that there are other worlds, like real worlds. Mm. And and even though there's a fantastical element, um, it's not fantasy. No. It, and, and so I just like to say, okay, people actually lived here before you. People lived in different ways, mm. but they still had the same feelings that you do and they were just as real as you and uh, yeah pain hurt them just as much um they may have believed quite differently but they still felt the same and so what i always hope is if you're looking at something as far removed as minoan crete then perhaps if you can if you can identify with a character in that, perhaps you can also start to identify with other people in, in your world now. Thank you so much for joining us. That was oh, so fun. It was brilliant. It really was. Thank you. Right. And we'll, we'll leave a link down the below so people can purchase as well. And we've got some book reviews up of the books on our website, which oh, people will be able to lovely. read as well. Thank brilliant. You Thank much. you, Wendy. Lovely okay. to meet you. Lovely to meet you, Kelly. Right. Have a Bye. great afternoon. Bye. Too. Bye. This video was brought to you by Ancient History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. Ancient History Encyclopedia is a not-for-profit organisation. If you'd like to support our work, hit the card up in the corner of the screen or via the link below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon.